Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center. And uh, we have a very special broadcast uh, this week for two reasons. One, we have a, a theme that's tying into National Pollinator Week, which we're all excited about. Uh, but the other unique thing is NCTC has been open for 16 years. We've probably done hundreds of these broadcasts and we've never had economists on before. And so this is very exciting uh, for us to have uh, Daniel and Claudia here this, e this evening and uh, talking about pollinators. So thank you guys for coming out here and, and setting a new precedent. Hopefully you won't be the last, depending on how you do. <laughs> and That's a tough idea. <laughs> so our, our guests today, who are gonna talk about pollinators and land health, uh, are Daniel Hellerstein and Claudia Hitai. And let me tell you a little about them before we get into their PowerPoint. Daniel is a senior economist at the Conservation and Environment Branch of the Resource and Rural Economics Division at the Economic Research Service of the USDA. His primary field of study is agricultural conservation programs and the provisions of ecosystem services, focusing on the Conservation Reserve Program, something we know very well in Fish and Wildlife Service. It's a huge boon to us. His past work includes classifying and measuring the amenity and environmental value of these programs and how these values change as policy and economic factors vary. And in recent years, he's been working a lot on land use and pollinator health, which we'll learn about in just a minute. Claudia is also an economist in the Conservation and Environmental Branch of the Research and Rural Economics Division at the Economic Research Service of the USDA. Her research interests include energy economics, environmental economics, and the economics of natural resources. She's currently researching the effect of land use on pollinator health, the greenhouse gas emissions associated with different diets at the population level, and the impact of shale oil and gas development on farm practices. And finally, energy consumption and production on farms. That's a big portfolio. Uh, she received her PhD in agricultural and resource economics from the University of Maryland, a master's in philosophy and environmental policy from the U University of Cambridge, and a BA in economics, mathematics, and biology from Yale University. And Daniel got his PhD and master's from Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and his BA from Brandeis University. So Daniel and Claudia, thank you so much for coming out today. Sure. And uh, we're going to turn it over first to, to Claudia to talk a little about pollinators and land health. Great. <laughs> yes, thank you. So we at ERS of USDA, we're engaged in two strands of research related to pollinators. One, we're looking at agricultural production, pollination services, honey production, and then the other strand of research looks at land use and how that affects pollinator health, and that's what Dan and I are, are researching in particular. Um, so I'll start off and hand it off to Dan in a little bit, but here's the outline. Um, I'll talk first a little bit about pollinators, give you an introduction, um, and look at the stresses they've been exposed to. Um, Dan will then talk about pollinators and land use, uh, he's done an extensive literature review. Uh, we have a data exercise showing some results. Um, and finally, he'll go into some economics because we're economists. And, <laughs> we, and we couldn't it. help ourselves. Well, we yeah. <laughs> so let's see. So the importance of pollinators, I'm sure if you wake up in the morning, you prefer the diet, the breakfast on the right. Um, animal pollinators um, assist in the pollination of two-thirds of our crops. And we're um, also fruit bugs. That's right. And so pollinators, well, we will focus mainly on the managed honeybee, but other pollinators include uh, over 4,000 species of native bees, butterflies, moths, bats, bugs. So there's a, there's a bunch, but we'll look mainly at um, the managed honeybee. Um, so pollination dependency, um, that's a measure, essentially, for example, here in this chart, you see almonds and apples they are 100% dependent on animal pollinators, wow. whereas oranges and grapes, they don't need animal pollinators, but they receive a yield boost. So this is what we mean by a pollinator dependency ratio. And um, recently, we have, as a society, we've become more dependent on pollinators over time. You can see that the dependency, essential, great, and modest has increased quite a bit since uh, the 70s. Is it just because yeah. the crop mix has changed, do you think? Or yeah, I think it's that we're consuming more of these crops. Um, and it could also reflect that local pollinators are becoming, or there's a decline in local pollinators, so uh, people actually need to bring in managed okay. honeybees. Um, 
So one of the first things um, ERS, the Economic Research Service, was tasked with was coming up with the value of honeybees. Um, so there is a simple way of doing that, which is just looking at beekeeper income. So how much, as a society, are we willing to pay beekeepers to have honeybees around? Um, that was about $940 million in 2012. Interestingly, about 70% of that was from pollination services. So it's, for a beekeeper, it's much more important um, than honey production. I think this has changed a lot. Um, it's for commercial beekeepers. Yeah, for which commercial. Which the vast majority of bees yeah. are commercially mm -hmm. maintained. And then, so next to this direct value, we also have an indirect economic value. Um, losses, in which we essentially would mean, well, what would happen if we no longer had any honeybees? Um, so one, the estimate we came up with is uh, $18.1 billion. This is sort of the short-term sudden loss of honeybees is what that measures. But it's a value that's very sensitive to data. So other estimates range from about $1 billion to $53 billion. And that's because um, you have to take into account uh, substitutes that are available, right. so both in consumption and production. So you might actually eat a different type of breakfast if, you know, almond, a cereal with almonds would be extremely expensive now. So there's some uh, substitution there, but there's also substitution in production. Um, so you can try to boost your yield in a different way, or um, there's also some interest in developing um, types of plants that are less dependent on animal pollinators, self-pollinating plants. In other words, this is a yeah. number which uh, it's a very diffused point estimate. Yeah. We don't want Between one and 55 billion. Yeah. yeah. We, uh, <laughs> it's a spread. This, Claudia is talking about, uh, a, not work we did personally, but another part of ERS. Yeah. We actually w did a fairly long, long report on this, and this is sort of the 18 billion was sort of the intermediate type estimate. So it's, it's, an, it's a large number, as Claudia would say. It's a striking yeah. number. But uh, it's so not something we are willing to you know, throw ourselves or our swords for. <laughs> That's okay. Um, all right. So. Here, because you saw the pollination services market is so important for be commercial beekeepers, um, this shows you average per hive rental fee and per hive income Maybe in the Pacific Northwest. So this is, I think, mainly California here. Um, and you can see that it's increased quite dramatically since you know, about 2005. Um, this reflects two things. Um, well, one, almond acreage increased by 27% over that time period. So I think, I guess, almond milk is becoming a lot more popular. Yeah. Um, so th that's one thing. And the other thing it reflects, could reflect, is that um, it's just become, it's more costly now for a beekeeper to maintain colony numbers in the face of the stressors that which honeybees are. Which we'll talk about. Yeah. We'll talk about. Um, and almonds, you know, they are very important. So about Almost half of the pollination fees that were collected in 2012 came from pollinating almonds, and about almost a fifth each for sunflowers and canola. For in terms of honey production, we've actually seen a slight decline. Um, this could reflect two things. One, it's just that pollination services have become more important, so there's no reason to collect any honey. Um, but it could also mean it's another indication that honeybees aren't as healthy as they used to be. So, for example, well, let me first define a hive and a colony. Colony is the family unit mm -hmm. of the honeybee. So it includes the queen, the worker bees, the brood, and drones. Those are the male bees. Um, and the hive just refers to the physical structure where they live. So those are those wooden boxes. And we should use them interchangeably, those two terms, but we do. Because we're <laughs> yeah, I didn't know there was a distinction. <laughs> yeah, well, and so um, the honey production, why that's declined over time, could be that, well, in the face of the stressors, um, beekeepers are splitting colonies. So if they lost a colony over the winter, yeah. they can take a colony and split it, add a new queen bee to uh, the other half. Uh, but they would need to leave more honey in the hive to allow the, both of those colonies to go back to their original health. Um, and another thing is, so be, um, these honeybees are trucked around the country to service pollination contracts, um, so you might also want to allocate more honey to the colonies so that they can better withstand the stress of travel. 
But I'm sure if you've read the news, you may have come across an article that, would <laughs> that says that the bees are dying or you know, there's a pollinators are threatened. And that's certainly true. I mean, we've seen, um, we've seen a, lot, a lot of articles in, in the, recently. And um, a lot of them focus on colony collapse disorder. So this rose to the attention in 2006. And it's actually a very specific form of colony loss. So a beekeeper losing one of his or her colonies um, over the winter or over summer. Colony collapse disorder is actually when um, beekeepers were reported about 30, losing 30 to 90% of their colonies, so almost all of their colonies. And you had a healthy, alive queen bee. Uh, you also had brood, you had honey, but there were no adult uh, worker bees present and there were no adult there were no dead bee bodies, so they had just disappeared. So this was called colony collapse disorder, and it sort of got the attention of the media, yeah. but it seems that recently colony losses have not been attributed to CCD, but something else. But even so, colony loss numbers are particularly high and still worrying. Mm -hmm. and I think we're still using that yeah. term colloquially. I hear all yeah. the time. CCD. Uh, CCD. There, the, for instance, the, uh, one of the USDA ARS groups to work on CCD. They've tried to change their name to be a little more general than just CCD. Yeah. So the numbers, well, we'll get to the numbers in a minute. So. Yeah. We're already learning great stuff, so thank Good. you guys. <laughs> so this chart is kind of neat. Um, it shows you, you know, all the factors <laughs> that impact honeybee health. Um, there's things that the beekeeper does, for example, applying miticides to get rid of varroa mites. Um, there's viruses, pathogens that honeybees are exposed to, like the deformed wing virus. Um, then, you know, they forage for food, so the availability of pollen and nectar is important. And then they're also exposed, there's possible sublethal effects of pesticides. So all of these work in conjunction to, um, you know, improve or uh, deteriorate honeybee health. Mm -hmm. This is the colony losses that I was talking about. Um, this is data collected from the Bee Informed Partnership, also um, in conjunction with APHIS from USDA. So you can see the gray bars show you what would be an acceptable winter loss as defined by the beekeeper. And you can see that wi actual winter losses in blue have been much higher. Um, and then beginning in 2010, uh, they started collecting data on total annual losses. So this included losses over the summer as well. And these have incre increased quite, dram quite dramatically. Um, and uh, Dennis von Engelsdorf, who's an entomologist at University of Maryland, he was saying that the increase in losses over the summer is actually more worrisome yeah. because you would expect some type of loss over the winter. Um, there's actually the structure of the, ho of the colony changes. Usually over the summer, bees live about four to six weeks. Over the winter, they, have to li they live four to six months. So you need to bring them out through the winter where there's no, you know, little forage available. Um, and so you expect some type of loss, but in the summer when they're actually at their healthiest, it's actually quite worrying to have these high losses. So colony numbers have declined. Um, we've seen quite a dramatic decline since the 1940s. Um, two caveats here. One, a data collection issue um, from in 1982, they stopped until 1982, they collected data from all beekeepers, but from then on, just from beekeepers that had at least five colonies. Um, and in uh, 1984 was the end of the honey price support program, um, which affected the beekeeping industry. But 1987, that dip was when the varroa mite was first detected, yep. and that really wreaked some havoc um, in the early 90s. But we should talk about the varroa mite a little bit because we mentioned it twice. Okay. Yeah, you, you say something. Okay. Mm -hmm. The varroa mite is a bug that infests uh, colonies. And it's, think of it as a softball-sized thing on the back of your neck that's sucking your blood out. So it weakens the uh, bees. And as individual bees die, you get enough of those, you have a colony in trouble. Uh, the varroa mite can just, one or two can show up in a colony and they just start spreading. Yeah. So they're a real big problem for uh, beekeepers and they try to treat them with miticides and things like that. And it does sort of work, but it does require a lot of you know, monitoring, expense, and it's not perfect. And it is one of the, uh, well, it's one of the, I suppose, major threats to the bee industry. And it also, through the mite, introduces diseases too. 
Exactly. It's like a vector. Yeah, so it's yeah. not only just weakening, but it's a vector for disease. The thing that strikes me from your graph, if we can go back to that for a sec, uh, is the the most drastic decline seems tied to the end of honey price support. <laughs> well, I was probably yeah, saying that, that, may, that may be tied to it. <laughs> and also the, yeah. uh, the, the change teams. in survey yeah. techniques. Yeah. Um, how, how much do we believe, you know? Yeah. It's certainly a long-term decline. Right. But actually, the next slide is interesting. Those don't always yeah. pop up in the way we do our graphs. Um, yeah. From a strictly yeah. You know. ecological perspective, we don't always it's have the data about We should say about the varroa mite being detected. It was detected. It, it, the prevalence grew and grew over time. So, you know, over the 90s is when it's really started to become a problem. So mm -hmm. is it more of a problem now or the same amount of problem as it was? Same it was amount. Detected? I would say it's more of a problem because now it's become more of a vector for diseases. Mm -hmm. More diseases. Yeah. There's always been diseases in the bee industry, though. So. Yeah. We're not entomologists, so when we get into those technical questions, <laughs> Actually, we're a little nervous. <laughs> you brought up the mite. Well, yeah. we'll, well bring I just our wanted caveat. basic knowledge. But once, you know, our, 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 our depth of knowledge in that is not terrible, but not great. <laughs> yeah. But the next slide, how do you show that yeah. one? Yeah, so this is colony numbers recently, and you can see that they've actually been quite stable, um, which throws in the question well, why do we see all these reports on the bees are dying? Um, well, that's because beekeepers, this is, you know, honeybees are managed, so beekeepers can intervene, they can split colonies, create new colonies. So that's why colony numbers isn't really the measure you should be looking at, is colony losses, uh, that previous slide that we had. I was looking at your mm -hmm. PowerPoint, because you guys mm -hmm. sent it to me mm -hmm. yesterday, and that was the most striking slide yeah. in the PowerPoint. I never would have predicted colony numbers have been stable. Um, and are these, we, we, your slides before identified, are these just the managed colonies or is this managed and wild? Yeah, because the, uh, I'm not sure. Managed and wild? No, that's not wild. So oh, no, the wi wild bees are pretty yeah. much very hard to find. Okay, so yeah. these are managed. We, don't, we just don't I'm know not if sure there's if people they include, with five. But or, recreational yeah. types may not be in there. Right. But by and large, most colonies mm. are managed these days. So I think you, I, 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 I should, I'm reluctant to say it, but I'm going to say it's probably 5 or 10% if you complete it, if you had everybody in there. But what Claudia like is telling us is the reason, in part, that maybe they haven't declined is is beekeepers are trying to I compensate for this. By yeah. I, would, by I would say that it's not in part. I think that is the reason. Uh, if you read the literature, and I, sh I don't know if I should put this plug in, but there's a great book called The Beekeeper's Dilemma. Is that it? No, Lament. The Beekeeper's Lament. It was uh, put out about two years ago. And they have a long book about uh, kind of following a particular beekeeper who talks yeah. about the amount of management is needed now. It just gets worse and worse. Harder. More and more all the time, dealing with the vector the diseases, dealing with the varroa mites, constant intervention. It's hard to do. But one of the interventions, as Claudia mentioned, is you take you buy a queen. There's a large queen industry, for instance, Hawaii, which doesn't have the varroa mite, produces three quarter million queens a year, which wow. they sell to the mainland. This California produces. So you buy your queen, and oftentimes they either come by themselves or with a couple a hundred other bees, and then you figure out different ways of splitting your hive, physically splitting your hive. So you, some you a queen goes with one set of the bees or with another set of bees. Or sometimes queens live about two years, and sometimes toward the end there, the, the beekeeper might replace the queen because they get old. So there's a it's pretty highly managed industry. Yeah. It's, it's not some <laughs> hippies, you know, sitting yeah. around the backyard. I, <laughs> right. I can say that with the hair, right? <laughs> no, but so that's not somehow how we envision it. Yeah, it's well, it's, it's, and it gets, and that, I think, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, sort of speaking, I won't be speculating, but you know, the, intuitively, there's a sense that the beekeepers are really seeing that it's become, um, you cannot, do this industry without being pretty heavily invested, and that sort of the backyard beekeepers, are, it's much harder to do. Yeah. So there's, we, there seems to be some consolidation in the industry, which we all follow closely, and that may be due to that. So, anyways. Good stuff. Yeah. Okay, so let me go to the next slide here. There is some regional variation in colony numbers. Um, I want to highlight two trends here, California and North Dakota. You can see that there's a lot, quite a bit of a decline of colonies that are in California and a big increase in North Dakota. And it's surprising, for one, because about two-thirds of all managed um, honeybees uh, descend on California almond country sure. in February. And so you actually require lots of honeybees in that state, but they actually don't uh, reside there throughout the year. Whereas in North Dakota, lots of uh, bees come to North Dakota and spend the summer there. But Dan will talk more about that. So I think now is when we switch over to Dan, he'll talk more about land use 
All right, so I'm Claudia did a really good job. Claudia, interrupt me like I interrupted you because you probably have <laughs> something worry, to say. Don't worry, don't worry. Yeah. Waiting to. Listen, <laughs> this is a conversation. This is unusual. Most of the time we get presentations, it's one way. So this is kind of nice. I like mm -hmm. it. So um, land use. Why is land use interesting? Um, well, there's a sense that land use could change how the overall health of the pollinators on moss. That if we have different kinds of vegetation on our land, they might do better. Uh, the Conservation Reserve Program, which I'm glad to hear everybody knows about, so I don't have to describe it, is, is a particularly interesting tool or resource that could be used by the government, USDA, to influence pollinator, to influence land use so as to better pollinator health, either by having more of it or by changing the, the, what cover is on its yeah. canopy. So we'll get to that more in a minute. So why should we care? Well, it's, it's if you have better health in pollinators and or honeybees in particular. Uh, there's more of them out there. The beekeepers have to pay less to keep them going. It's you know more need more honey and cheaper pollination services. Uh, but as Claudia indicated with that flat line graph, right now it seems that the industry is kind of adapting. The prices are going up for pollination services, especially in almond country, because that's when they need, need a lot of people. And honey production is going down. But it, that's not terrible. Why should we care as society? And I would speculate, and this is me speculating rather than USDA opinion that uh, what if things get worse? How much robustness is in this system? What if we have another CCD type event and instead of losing 30%, we lose 70? So there's a notion that um, better land use may be a way of offsetting a lot of these negative impacts, possibilities. I'm gonna tell a little story, but let me go on to the next slide first. Mm -hmm. So, which one do I press? Yeah, right. Okay, mm -hmm. top one? No. no. The right one out, okay. that's obvious. All right, so why do we care about land use? Well, land use, by which I mean covers on the land, whether you have grasses or forbs or trees, mm -hmm. that means forage, stuff for bees to eat, in particular nectar to gather, uh, pollen. Turns out, this is interesting, that bees have 10 amino acids they require. So variety matters. They just, some uh, pollen may be lacking some of those, and maybe quite a bit of it. It's like human beings have, I think, about the same similar number of amino acids. You get. That's why vegetarians eat beans and rice, because they can complement. At least that's the story I've heard. Um, so, and if you have more nectar and more pollen and more trace minerals and what would be the equivalent of vitamins, which are less is known about them, you should have a healthier colony. More brood, more babies to replace your uh, bees when they die. And it's a funny thing about bees. Claudia has mentioned they live in the four to six weeks. And it turns out in a healthy colony, bees die quickly when they leave. So that or, or bee, I'm pushing my knowledge here, but uh, so you have a colony, and a lot of them stick around. They, they, when they first get born, they become nurse bees, and then they clean up and guards. But at, toward the end of their life, they're kicked. They're not kicked out. They go out and do foraging. So as the bee gets, as the colony gets stressed, they, there's more. They, they go out earlier. Okay? So having a lot of brood is, is a sign of a healthy colony, and one that will better survive the stresses of the winter and whatever. So. Uh, so if we have better forage, maybe we'll have better food and healthier colonies and bees, and we, will have, we can avoid some of these problems. So we have the mite and the pesticide issues, which we don't talk a lot about because right. the science is still unclear. And we're, you know, we're, we're, we're <laughs> with converse bureaucrats here, especially when it gets outside of our field of economics. <laughs> yeah. So we'll talk about the pesticide in a bit, but not a lot. And the travel stresses and whatnot. So maybe, maybe not a magic bullet, but maybe this will be a way to alleviate some of these stresses. And there's a, an ARS colleague of mine, who I, he hates me using the quotes, I won't say his name, but you think about pollinators, there, it's like you're living in a rough neighborhood and there's chemical pollution and there's smog and there's uh, stress. The last thing you want to be is eating a crummy diet. So that if you yeah. give them a better diet, maybe they can it helps survive the other stressors. So that's kind of the, the hope in a way of a land use policy is designed to make pollinators, uh, give better pollinator f uh, habitat. Now, that, I'm just talking about honeybees mostly. I'll just talk about native pollinators a bit. Uh, native pollinators are a little bit different. They do require good forage, but they also require nesting places. Mm -hmm. So they either nest in tr old trees or in the ground. Well, it turns out that bare dirt is good nesting habitat for a lot of these native bees. So let's move on. I did. You did already. Thank you. So uh, Claudia mentioned that we were uh, we've been working on this uh, issue of pollinators for about a year or two now. And when we first got assigned this task, which was a kind of fun thing to get assigned, so I didn't complain in the slightest, I had to learn about it. So we did a literature review. I did one, and with the help of a, 
some of our colleagues out there in uh, South Dakota and places like that who sent us me a bunch of articles. And what can we learn from the uh, I don't know, 50 or 70 articles I've seen that, that talk about land use in Pioneer Hill? Uh, well, there's a lot of themes that kind of come through. Uh, we have a report actually that's going to come out hopefully in a couple of months, and we'll have a, a link to it where we go through oh. this in, in greater detail. Like there's a couple, there's just been several meta analyses of the studies over time. And an interesting thing about the studies is that over the last decade or so, they've really increased in numbers as the interest has gone up. Mm -hmm. So anyways, um, so different kinds of, of land use have different effects on pollinators. And what they often do is they'll go, they'll monitor what land uses are on a site, and they'll go out in the field and they'll capture bees or watch them and record the different varieties. And the more sophisticated ones will actually look at production from mm -hmm. an ag crop that's near uh, you know, different land uses. And so some of the uh, findings, we'll get to that in a minute. So uh, forage and nesting sites matter for, for native pollinators. Um, distance is a big deal, actually. And you, when you think about native, one of the things that differentiate native pollinators, which is a you know, large number of, of critters or bugs or whatever, and the honeybees is the range. Honeybees tend to be pretty big, and they're generalist. And their range is two miles or so. They'll, I mean, it's better if you have two near them because it's less energy, yeah. but they will go that far. Whereas native pollinators, in general rule of thumb, is after about 500 meters. They don't go further. And frankly, I think a lot of research suggests that maybe 100, 200 is really wow. their effective range. They're small. And most native pollinators are solitary. They're not living in colonies. Like bumblebees are an exception. So you have a, lots of these, and they're just solitary bugs. They fly out. They, they may only be active for a couple months or even less. And they come back and they dig their little tubes in the ground or in their trees and dead stumps. And they lay you know, a dozen or 20 eggs or something. And then they, they hatch maybe next year. And I, I don't want to be. Don't take me too literally, because yeah. <laughs> this is what I understand. I'm, I'm probably making a few mistakes. But nevertheless, most native pollinators are not colonies. They live individually, and there are far fewer of them. So this is one of the interesting things about there's a debate in the bee world about natives versus non-natives, yeah. and there's interesting management issues. But uh, where was that at? Yeah, so distance, distance matters for honeybees and for native bees. Distance is a different beast. Actually, I'll get that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, importance of sources, uh, and I've mentioned the amino acid stuff, mm -hmm. and also the notion of timing. Uh, bees are funny. I mean, we'll think about honeybees. When I say bees, I tend to mean honeybees, but I'll try to say honeybees all the time because that's a kind of a technical term of art. And it's Apis mellifera is the proper Latin name. I Not bumblebee. <laughs> no, bumblebees are different. They're different. The honeybees and the bumblebees are different species. Bumblebees are, I think they die off every year. Or, I mean, they're just, they're different. They're not managed either. Well, actually, there are bumblebees. I think they use them in greenhouses. But uh, otherwise, generally, the bees that are manager, honeybees. I didn't said, mean to digress. Yeah. Oh, I love digressing. <laughs> You've got to stop me from digressing. That's my biggest problem. Uh, where's I at? Um, so, yes, um, timing. So, bee honeybees do store their nectar and their pollen and they mm -hmm. create brood. So, you would think that maybe they don't need a constant availability of food and forage. But it turns out that they're, I won't say they're dumb, but they tend to eat what's available. So they may store quite a bit of stuff, but if there's a, a rich source out there which is kind of deficient in some amino acids, that's what they'll eat. So there is some notion that for even for honeybee health, you want to have you want to avoid too many long droughts, which can be difficult. Um, I'll probably get this wrong, but I think like late June in certain parts of the country, there's maybe not a lot of stuff out there. So how do you design a land use that would get that would have that? Yeah. Now, that's a tricky question, but I'll, I'll make, let me skip that for the moment. So next slide. All right, so what are our general findings? I sort of talked about them already, but uh, we say them again. And that is that, yeah, habitat does seem to improve pollinator health. And there are some crops, they did studies on watermelons, blueberries, tomatoes also, that benefit from native pollinators that rely on quality habitat. In other words, you have quality habitat in your field, and you measure the output, and oh, yep, you know, we can see more bees visitation, and we see higher output. So uh, it's not really surprising, I guess. Location matters. Uh, we talked about natives that, uh, being close is, is, can, be, can be a big deal. Uh, and the different kinds, hedgerows versus uh, open fields. So, and as I mentioned, native pollinators are, are, honeybees aren't quite the same. So let me uh, reiterate that point. Let's talk about natives. Variety of land is near fields is best. And uh, there's an interesting question about the activity. If you have a, if you're able to somehow uh, structure your land near your cropland, your native lands and your cropland in a way that encourage one set of pollinators. You would want to encourage a set of pollinators that are active when your crops need pollination. So a week yeah. or two period, let's say. If you have an, a great native pollinator community that's not coming out during that period, it's not so good. 
Um, there's also some interesting questions about um, um, whether if you plant something, it will attract bees rather than going to your crop line. Yeah. But we'll get that in a minute. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of literature on, actually on the literature review I mentioned, it, much of it is actually about native bees. So, it, but that's a funny thing because in general, there's a lot more known about honeybees because it's an active industry for I don't know 200 years or 5,000 years, depending on how you measure it. Um, but so we know there's a moderate amount known about how land use affects pollinators and native pollinators. Less known about honeybees. I think probably the reason is if you go out there, you're you're an entomologist, you do these fancy studies, and you're capturing the bees and you're measuring them. You had identifying is a real challenge. Yeah, honeybees just all of a sudden show up. Is that because this is a great crop or because somebody moved the hive in? So it's hard to separate that out. So the research on how land use affects honeybee health is kind of really sort of starting up now. And there's a number of people working that. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. So let's move on. Um, oh, honeybees, yes. Uh, as I mentioned again, I don't know if it's, I guess it's okay that I presage my comments that uh, honeybees, it's a bit different because they have a longer flight radii, like two miles or so, and the colonies are movable. Highly movable. So the exact placement of hive may not matter quite as much for their long term. The exact placement of landscape where the landscape is defined by different land uses may not matter quite as much. They can fly around, the, land, the beekeeper can move the hive. Thereby move so the you're talking about where you would target CRP? Yeah, or, or, or yeah. that's an example. Or mm -hmm. where you would say uh, if CRP is a good example. Supposing mm -hmm. you want to increase CRP. And you say, well, we want to go to a region and, you know, it you doesn't necessarily have to be right CRP. next. Oh, yeah, conservation yeah. Reserve Program. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah. should I define it a little bit? No, 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 just no. the acronym. Conservation, conservation <laughs> Reserve Program. Yeah. I'm so used to working on CRP. <laughs> I know it just comes out automatically. Mm -hmm. uh, supposing, as an example, we decided we had some amount of money to build, get some more CRP land. We were doing it for pollinators or other kinds of land, EQIP or CSP or state programs, mm -hmm. we want to place it, and we want to place it to benefit honeybees and crops, yeah. you know, strawberries or almonds. If, for, if you say, we're going to focus on native bees, you probably have to think very carefully about where that land was, because if it's a mile away, say we get a big chunk of native lands and put on some wonderful crop, some wonderful mixture of forbs that provide really good pollen and, and nectar, and it's not close to the crop land, it's not going to be very helpful. For honeybees, a little less so because yeah. they have a longer radius mm -hmm. and they can move around. And let's talk about the moving around. That's a good segue. And the moving around. Oh, there we go. This is a cool map that's put together by our colleagues up in the eighth floor, the seventh floor, excuse me. Yeah. And uh, it shows some of the mic, the paths of the of the beekeeper, where they go around. And they move on quite a bit. They can <laughs> put you know a thousand hives on yeah. a truck, truck them from Florida where they spend their they tend to spend their summers in warmer places. Though there is a one fairly well-known beekeeper who keeps his bees in Idaho in, in potato cellars. Because they don't want to be too cool. You want to be cool, but not active, but not too cold. But anyways, they show up in California in the almond country, which is about 800,000 acres now, almost maybe a million. It grows all the time. They show up in early February. Sometimes people come earlier to set up, but sometime around late February to March when the pollination season is in full blast. And then after that's over, they'll move up the coast and do the various other berries and whatnot, and then come the summertime, they end up in the Dakotas. Like two-thirds of the commercial honeybees are in the Dakotas, quite a few. And why the Dakotas? Uh, there is a sense, and I, I can't doubt it, because this is what honeybee, the beekeepers think, is that the Dakotas are, are the best part of the country for having bee health get better and for accumulating honey. It's got a mixture of crop vegetation. It may not have quite the large farms you'll have in the more of the corn belt or whatever, um, it's got things like canola and sunflower, which are very good. So they, that's considered to be a primary summer, oversummering spot. And so it's really, so this is when we think about the CRP, is that well, the CRP has actually declined in the Dakota, so that's a concern. There's also, you know, we have some colleagues, Clint Otto out in the USGS on South Dakota, has done some work showing that where CRP has declined, it's actually kind of where the best part of South Dakota is. So there's a chunk of sort of mid-south and North Dakota where it's wet enough and not cold enough and not super ag, but that's where the, um, a lot of the beekeepers are. So there's some, those are some of the concerns about land use, which we're going to actually get into a little more detail. Mm -hmm. ah. So here's a question. Um, there is a uh, common thought, and I don't say common, there is a professed notion that uh, the landscape of the United States has gotten worse for pollinators and bees in particular, and because of uh, more monoculture, greater herbicides, and things like that. And uh, 
one of the, Marla Spivak, who's an entomologist in the University of Minnesota, has a really nice TED talk where she discusses this. Mm -hmm. And she's a highly, you know, she's a very competent person. So this is not some, you know, silly notion. This, and the beekeepers think that, a lot of them think, I think that also. So we uh, thought, well, can we, uh, can we examine this contention? Can we test this hypothesis? And I thought, yeah, we'll give it a try. Um, we understand our data available to us is limited. And there's going to be better data in the future. All the, and we're, we're funding ourselves uh, more work and other people in USDA too. But let's take a shot at it. And so what we did is we took advantage of a data source called the National Resources Inventory, mm -hmm. NRI for short. Um, NRI has been uh, going on since 76 or so, maybe earlier. But we have access to data from 1982 to actually 2012. So the, I should little provis the little not warning, <laughs> heads up. I'm going to be talking about the next five or so slides, data that, uh, the analysis we did about a month or two ago. We just got some new data in, or some new uh, parameters. So we're going to redo this. So we may end up uh, substituting these slides later, or pro we'll probably do it over a link to our report, which will have the more recent, re more recent findings. But from what we've looked at from the, the new data, it doesn't change the quality of what we find. Okay. So NRI, lots of points, almost a million. Actually, there's more, but we focus on a million because we get rid of urban and federal lands with time series from 82 to 2010. So this is, and one of the variables, the key variable from our point of view that the NRI collects is the land use. And there's like, you know, there's grassland, there's a range, and there's a bunch of crops in there. Right. There's 59 di different values for in this, 59 different possible values, ver values for that land use variable. So we said, you know, can we use, we have a time series of land use and land use that's, that should matter, but how do we convert land use to be quality? So this was where the weakest part of our model is right now, and this is why I'm hemming and hawing a lot. Uh, we got from our colleagues, uh, we have cooperators, Eric Lohensdorf, Emily Davis, Eric Lohensdorf is a pretty well-known uh, bee researcher, and he's done some interesting work on, on similar issues of uh, habitat loss. And he, with his, some of his uh, collaborators at Penn State, gave us a Ford suitability index number, which in our current analysis goes from 0 to 0.75, and in our new one goes from about 0 to 0 0.64, well, whatever. But the number goes between 0 and 1, and the higher number is better forage for bees from this class of land. Okay. So a value of corn is 0.20 or something, and sunflower is 0.5, and, pat and CRP is about, you know, CRP that depends, but you can give it a number of 0.5. Now, actually, that's... Does anything reach 1? No. <laughs> in this particular metric, no. Okay. So it's, like, uh, you know... And as I said, we kind of change our parameters. They kind of tighten up a bit. And actually, the change parameters, we have more for pretty much for what we're using now. Crop is all about the same. And okay. we got better numbers to differentiate that a bit, which is useful. So um, I want to stress that this is just a measure of forage suitability. Sure. It doesn't talk about a lot of other stuff. And I keep on hemming and hawing, but you'll see why in a minute. Tell us what you found. Dave. Yeah, <laughs> come on. I want to. You're getting impatient, aren't you? Uh, I'm not going to do it quite yet. <laughs> I have to talk a little about methodology. So what we did is we took these FSI scores and we either yeah. tracked each point, and, you know, and see how uh, how points change. You know, what fraction of the points get better or worse, and then we can do some aggregations over region too. So here's uh, is that yeah. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about before we get into this the B stuff. It's just about total land use, and uh, these are kind of rough charts, but. CRP has gone from zero in 82 to you know, 24 million acres now. Back in 2007, it was 35. Uh, cropland has shrunk a little bit. Grassland has increased, maybe decreased a little bit. Not really huge changes, really, you know, other than the CRP. So perhaps we shouldn't expect any huge changes from this index. And what do we find? Well, look at that central thing. No change. Now, what this is, is we look at each point. We take an endpoint of 1982 and 2010. We take the, land, the FSI, the country land use, and we just say which ones have increased and decreased, and we have a, a numeric value. And for 85% of the points in the country, there has been no change in FSI score. Now, that doesn't mean no change in land use, just no change in the B Ford suitability of that land. Right. Uh, and here's where it gets a little bit interesting. And if you look at the decrease and increase, it's actually more lands have gotten better and have gotten worse, according to this model, which is, to say the least, curious, given the four slides ago I was talking about, you know, respected people are very concerned about the overall land use of the country. So um, before I talk about that a bit, let's, there's some regional differences. And 
And we'll notice, first of all, uh, between 02, around 02 and especially in 07, this chart ends a little early, there is some sense of decline over across the nation. And also, in a place like North Dakota, where is that line on that map? It's rising better than Well, there's a, the lake states and northeastern. Yeah, the Great Plains. Mm -hmm. Seems that like maybe they've gotten a little worse. And yeah. if, if it got, let's think. We need to think of this more carefully. Let's be think that if North Dakota has gotten worse, maybe because there's less CRP, and maybe especially in that, in that little chunk of North Dakota, or that this half size chunk of North Dakota where the bees, where the kiwis, the beekeepers tend to congregate. From the beekeeper point of view, the country has gotten worse because where they're going has gotten worse. So that's, that's possibly one explanation. Though I think that uh, a better explanation is our model is exploratory. And uh, we shouldn't take it as the end word. And I, so I'm not going to trash my own model, which believe me, other people have done. And I can't say they're wrong. I mean, I think there's something mm -hmm. here, um, but it's not the end word. So what are some of the issues? Well, right now, the current version, the ag land is pretty much all the same. Well, that will change, but uh, and forest and range, they, that's also all the same. But I think the bigger question, the bigger flaw in this class of models is that it takes land use as land use. There's no differentiation. So we don't think about insecticide use at all. Yep. I mean, the whole you know, NIC controversy, which may or may not matter. I mean, it certainly does sometimes, but still open mm -hmm. question. And so I'm trying, I'm avoiding controversy, obviously. <laughs> Change in herbicide use. Now, herbicides are important in two ways. Um, well, I think that the, the state of the art scientific thinking about bee health is that uh, sublethal effects add up. And uh, if there's this Dennis Van Engelsdorp, who's the, runs a bee lab in Maryland, you know, a real connected guy. He's, uh, he's, you know, we had the pleasure of talking to him. Well, yeah, we went out to visit. They gave us a thing of honey. Whenever you visit <laughs> these guys, they give you honey, which is kind of fun. Uh, but he talks about. Uh, how these small difference, you know, a little bit of here, a little bit here can add up and make a big difference. So herbicides both are, they are interesting because they're another chemical. And they're also interesting because... You mean the honeybee ingests them? Yeah, yeah. You yeah. ingest all these different things, right? Them, yeah. You get a little of this, a little of that. One in and of itself, one of them may not matter. If you add this to this to this, you may get, maybe be nonlinear impacts. Yeah. So there's not a lot. There's just starting to work on that stuff. It's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. um, but also, if you have a lot of herbicides, you may have less weed in your field. And that's what the bees eat. Yeah. As these beekeepers have said, our bees are eating weeds. That's the reality <laughs> of it. Um, so how about increased field size? I remember meeting a farmer at a, one of our USDA events and talking. He's a CRP guy. He said, oh, yeah, I've got my fields have gotten bigger, bigger equipment. There's less hedgerows or you closer to a stream. Well, that's the place where the weeds used to grow. That's where the bees right. could eat. So increased field size may have a negative impact on bees. Uh, crop management, that's an interesting question. This early health alpha harvest, I have one of my buddies at work, is a, he's a Kansas farmer boy. He's a, we talk about, oh yeah, we all knew when I was going to undergrad that you harvest health alpha early for more nutrition. That's before it flowers. So alfalfa is a great crop for honey, yeah. but if you're, for bees, but if you're harvesting early, it doesn't help. So maybe there's been change like that. So in our model, we don't know anything about that. So what can we do? Well, we should be building better models. And as a matter of fact, we are. My gosh. <laughs> and uh, I mentioned Eric Lonsdorf and Emily Davis is, our, is, is working together. Actually, Emily's our main contact, and they're building a model they call a bay, which is Emily Davis is Emily's French. So that was a cute name we came up with. Can you, what's the name? What does that sound like? A bay? Well, French? Oh, I don't know what it sounds for. Yeah, we got it written down. No. You can look. <laughs> yeah, I know. We'll, 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 we'll have it in the report. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's really, it used to be an invest model. People know the invest family of models. It came out of that. It was funded by people out of, uh, out of USGS, and we, we heard about it and said, oh, my God, this is exactly what we need. So we ended up finding some co-op money for them. They're, they're working with us. It's quite a pleasure. So what they want, the one thing they're doing is they're working with a, a finer grid using NLCD, and we're going to uh, try to give them more data. So CLU, Common Land Unit, is FSA's, Farm Service Agency's, field database. They've had, you know, but some time, you know, it's been around forever, and it's probably around 2010, they finally got it fully vectorized. And they have crop history on these things. So it's, it's quite a rich database. Uh, so we'll try to use those, that kind of information rather than our million NRI points. You know, let's use a, you know, a billion whatever uh, NLCD points. We're trying to incorporate edginess, so we do have the CLU boundaries as a measure of edginess, and we have a uh, road network, so we're trying to give them the coverage on that. These, this, the Bay model is basically a, 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 a calibrated GIS model, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And we're trying to do some expectancy exposure stuff, so we do have information about uh, how, what kind of test sites are applied 
by crop, by region. It's a, USGS has some of this stuff there. We have some. It's, there's interesting privacy issues, so we, we have to be careful with that. And plus, we have some metrics of, uh, of LC, LD50 for different chemicals for bees. I mean, they're, some of these are expert assessments, so they're, you know, they're better than nothing. We also have EPA, some of their listings. So we're, we're working on that now, trying to put together pesticide coverage. And part of what the AFA model does is that it works by, they have some measures of honey production, and they're getting more of them, which they take as a measure of bee health. And they, they do this GIS coverage of run, and they know location of a hive. They have a, an interesting data set, which is not a large story. <laughs> and so they try to correlate land use to honey production. Well, let's throw another coverage, throw on exposure to pesticides. So they're not necessarily making a scientific remark about, you know, which biologists much prefer. They're being acting like a con. So, oh, let's just throw in some data, see what pops up. So that's obviously is problematic because you may be making a mistake, but it does hint or help you think about what may matter. And our call is to, if we have this a robust model, which we're hoping, you never know, failure is often one of the outcome, but you never give up, to be able to model how land use changes would affect bee health and then do some economic -y thinking, think about how that will affect pollinator service fees and things like that. So that's kind of our long-term goal. So this earlier model I just showed is kind of a sort of intermediate product. And that's why cloud exploratory research, and we recognize it. But I would say this, that when I think about what our model tells us is that I think the ma major message, and Pilate, correct me if you think I'm uh, missing something, is that as we move forward, and we being us, and uh, there's several other groups working on these issues, we need to be careful not to take too many shortcuts with just using land use. We have to somehow incorporate all these other things. They may matter a lot. Uh, so that's my... There's balancing the... Well, you know, there's <laughs> the easy, the land use is easier. Yeah, yeah expediency yeah. versus accuracy. And so right. we went for expedient because we're, it's the first thing, exploratory. But it can't be the end. So uh, and I, I've, uh, we sent our, this analysis out to other people. And some people, oh, that's really wonderful. You should talk more about it. And I told them, wait, this is too flawed. So <laughs> it's great <laughs> having two reviews because you can <laughs> cut a path in between. But I, I do want to try to be careful about discussing that we, we, f we have some findings. We don't think they're... they're Completely crazy, but we think they're uh, they they just you know well we always like to take further research needed. <laughs> so, yeah. all right. So that's really the end of it. Let me just summarize what we uh. No, you just oh no, I'm not that at all. We have one new section. <laughs> all right. So now oh, we get into the dry quickly. stuff. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. This is the this is the what, this is why we, we as economists can bring to the table, and it's actually a pretty general thing. So it shouldn't be too hard. And the question is, is there a reason for us? the federal government, the USDA, whoever, to care about this stuff. I mean, markets work pretty well, often. Should yeah, we markets saw that work? Colony numbers are stable, so. Yeah, that, that yeah, seems yeah. to suggest the market. This pollination service mm -hmm. fees are, is a much bigger, more formal industry than it used to be. This adaptation is possible. Do we need to worry about this? And I would say, as an economist who spent my career working on environmental issues, yes, there, there's issues about markets not working too well when you have various externalities and public goods, public assets issues. An externality is a technical term means something that happens outside of a transaction. So if I buy your car manufacturer, I buy a car from you, and your factory produces pollution, me, you, the pollution is emitted to the environment and may damage people, but as a producer and a consumer, it's not part of our market transaction. So uh, in a certain sense, you're taking advantage of the disposal service of the environment for free even though it's affecting people. So these are extra, what a technical definition of externality is. So are there externality types of things that are prevalent in the um, market for, in, in the land use pollinator world? So let's think about four stylized actors. There's the pollinator dependent farmer, an almond grower, let's say, the beekeeper, a landowner who can provide land for forage, so that may be the almond grower, but it may be some guy in North Dakota, and the government, us. So let's think about this uh, one at a time. A farmer may has a decision a bit to make. Now, maybe it's not a practical one, but you could think about it. Do I want to depend on honeybees, pay some guy 150 bucks a hive or two hives per acre in, in California? It's about 8% of the cost. Um, it's really profitable. Yeah. Uh, or do I want to depend on native pollinators? I'm an apple guy in Pennsylvania, let's say. I just have enough trees around, and they'll, they'll, they'll be done. So if, they if the farmer decides to set aside land and maybe even manage it for pollinators, that means that land's not available for growing anything. So there's an opportunity cost to it. And so that's, he's got to factor that in. But that should be a solvable problem. But what if he sets aside land and these little 
bees that are doing great on it, and they fly off the neighbor's land, and they go pollinate his crops. Yeah. You can't control these characters. Right. Well, that's not a sin, but it does change the calculus of the farmer, of, the, of that farmer. He goes, well, you know what, if, I, if half the bees pollinate my land, half go elsewhere else, and supposing I cost me 100 bucks to set aside this acre because I'm not growing something, and I'm getting uh, 70 bucks worth of, of production extra on my land, my neighbor's getting 70, so it's a, it's a good thing in general, but I, I'm losing $30 on the deal. He'll, be, he'll have a disincentive to do it, even though from some social point of view it should be done. So now that would be a, 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 that's the neighboring farmer getting a positive externality right. that he gets for free. And unless there's some way to coordinate, you'll see less provision. Now, there are obviously ways of coordinating it. But one thing, if you're a big enough farmer, you own a you know, square mile and you put a spot right here and there, you may capture all the bees. Or you could collaborate with the farmer. So these are, it's not impossible, but it does suggest that markets may not always work. So. Very interesting. Yeah. So, what about beekeepers? Uh, I didn't put my part one. Sorry, I'll have to just look at the mm -hmm. slides. So, beekeeper, he, uh, there's a couple reasons why you might want to have land that provides good forage. He may want to have such lands in the neighborhood where his pollination services are happening so the bees can get a little more variety. Uh, maybe they'll get some of those amino acids they're not, get, they're not receiving from whatever crop they're supposed to pollinate. And I think maybe it's just as important, maybe even more important, is when they go off the, their honey production zones, the Dakotas, let's say, where they get fat and happy over the summertime, they may say, geez, you know, we want to, maybe we could, if we could pay a farmer or a landowner, we're not going to be a farmer, to put a better, more interesting crop mix on their land. Land is more, rather than some boring grasses on a CRP land, pay them to put some a mix of forbs and herbs there. You know, there's a lot of work done on what's good. Why do they do that? I mean, that seems like sensible. It's part of their economic calculus. Again, we have these open access issues that may limit that capability. For one, as I mentioned, bees fly around, especially honeybees. So if you pay a farmer to uh, uh, put on a real nice cover crop, let's say, or cover crops, or I want you to say crops, a mix of herbs, forbs and shrubs or whatever, and some guy a mile away goes, hey, my bees are going to take that. So all of a sudden you have the same problem. It's, it's hard to get everybody co coordinated to if some people can free ride. Um, there's also an interesting question that if, uh, if you put on some a suite of, of plants, there's only a limited amount of pollen and, and uh, nectar in that. And if some other guy's bees come and take it, you actually will lose a bit. So there's, it's, there's some interesting possible problems. Now, it turns out in, it, it, there seems to be some informal territories in a lot of the states where this is my territory and that's yours, but it's informal. People, there's nothing really... In many cases, there's nothing enforcing it. Though there are some states, I think uh, I've got something in my mind, that actually enforce that, that you can register your hives commercial, and no other commercial beekeeper can register within two miles. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of assigning a property right, yeah. and which sort of, sort of solves this problem a little bit. I mean, it's interesting. It's a property right because I happen to go to some landowner and contract to put my land there. All of a sudden, somebody else can't do it. It's an interesting solution. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, some people may not like it. Some people might it's think like it's fine. It's like grazing rights, basically. <laughs> yeah, but this is for land that the, the bees fly over right. to somebody else's land. Yeah. So it's like you're kind of assigning grazing rights. On private land. On right? private <laughs> land to somebody who's maybe first come, first serve. I yeah. mean, an economist may think, well, that's official. Nobody really care. But the guy who got there a day late may say, well, why is that proper? So I, I don't want to comment, you know, on the ethicalness of this, but it's certainly an interesting issue. Um, Oh, so that is the slide I had before. You made the thing about grazing. The bees are funny because they're partly they're like livestock managers moving around the country. Right. They're also like agricultural workers who move around the country. Yes, they're like, it's like a combination. They look like a both. migrant worker. But yeah, just kind like of. Cycle is and they're also time, like, so. oh, those, you know, <laughs> cattle rain. They go up to Dakota yeah. and they come on down. So it's a, it's an interesting thing. They're highly they're, the commercial. Well, you industry. had the suggestion earlier, slide. Yeah. Are they livestock? Um, well, and they do they seem are. to be, first of all, one of the only insects we've domesticated. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, and there are these functions, livestock type functions. Right. They're going out there and getting the fat and honey. Economics is fun. <laughs> it <laughs> makes is. us look at the world <laughs> in a different way. Uh, that's nice of you to say that. <laughs> yeah. I but I digress. That. We're on to the land. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I digress. I digress more. Uh, landowners. So uh, I'm thinking of, you know, either the, I, I think you can think of a landowner, not necessarily a farmer. The guy, the beekeeper would contract with to put on some nice forage so that his bees would get healthier and he can all be better off. Uh, they'll have a similar kind of problem. How do they strike a deal with the beekeeper when the beekeeper is reluctant to do it because some other bee guy will take it, you know, will, uh, some other beekeeper will 
get the advantage of, of what he's paying for. So the landowner may be willing to do this, but does he have a partner that he can count on? I mean, maybe a landowner can collaborate with the collection of beekeepers in the neighborhood, but that's just a coordination problem. And we economists actually call it a Coastian problem, if you want to be technical about it. Which is not, not insolvable, but there's transaction costs and maybe more difficult. And I mentioned before the, uh, the whole exclusion A thing. That's a way to solve that. Um, not without controversy, I suspect. Uh, we haven't really, we're actually going to look at that a bit more, one of our colleagues, so we may have more to say about that in a year or so. All right, what about the government? What can they do? Well, the government, it's uh, us. <laughs> it's us. I know. We hope the government, a fu well-functioning government, I'm going to be a little economic ease here, should have the overall social welfare of society in its mind when it makes decisions, social welfare being how wealthy we are as, a, as, a, as a, mm -hmm. an ent ent entirety. So they may not care as much about particularly winners and losers. So if we go do some land use change, and if, everybody, if, 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 if society's better off than, than the cost, the opportunity cost of making this change, and we lose some corn, yet the pioneers are better off and there's better, more almonds, that's good. We, we're not going to worry too much about that. You know, the distribution. The distribution is important, but we can deal with that elsewhere. So what can the government do? Well, they could organize markets for land, for yep. beekeepers to discuss with, with landowners how to do that, and they, oh, which happens. They also, there's more of a registration services where you, um, a beekeeper will register where the hive is and a, a spray applicator. In some sites it's actually required, like Iowa. They'll look on that and they'll coordinate. So there's that. The government can do that. They can improve access to forage on existing public land. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of BLM land out there, Forest Service land. So why aren't we letting the beekeepers go there? I would say there's, well, one reason may be because bees need water, so if it's drier, it'd be harder. Right. But there's another, I think, more interesting reason is that you get a big old colony with 50,000 bees, and they're flying around. There's only a limited quantity of nectar available. And if you have these natives that are, they're not competing with them a bit. Right. I mean, we don't really know how much it is, but you can see it could be an issue. And if your goal as an agency is to maintain native ecosystems, do you really want honeybees out there competing? It's like having Good cattle point. compete with your deer yeah. or something. So, interesting question. I don't have the answer to that one. How about paying for better forage on private lands? You know, like an equip kind of thing. You know what I mean to find equip? Yes. Environmental Quality <laughs> Incentives Program. Yep. It's run yeah. by NRCS, National Resource Conservation Service, and they, there's about a billion a year. They pay farmers and landowners to do better things on the land that are more conservation friendly. A lot of that's wildlife, uh, livestock oriented. But yeah. there are, you know, there could be, I'm not sure if there are pollinator. I think there are pollinator. Uh, initiative and equip. It's so fairly too. small, mm -hmm. but it's there. So they could do that. Or the last thing, which is we're getting the CRP again, is encourage pollinator forage and set-aside lands, yeah. such as the CRP. And there's two ways of doing that. Well, you know, you could have more CRP land. Mm -hmm. It's going to be tricky. you got to get through Congress. Or you could uh, encourage farmers to put better coverage on existing CRP land. So, yeah. I don't know, geez, I should know this number, but uh, maybe a half or so of existing CRP land is fairly not super great for pollinators, grasses. Uh, so how do you, can you pay people who actually do that? Maybe mid-contract or with new contracts? And how much do you do? So there's active research on what is in a, a cost-effective method. So you can spend 170 bucks an acre, let's say, to put on a really great suite of plants that are available all year long, providing pollen. That's a lot of money. Can you do nearly as well for, say, 60? So this yeah. is something that's really being looked at. But the general sense is that you know this standard old CRP land is okay, but not great. But you put on better stuff, and you can make a real difference. So I'm going to make a prediction that this is going to be a hot issue. There, it's probably being researched, and there is a CP42 practice in CRP, which is this pollinator practice, and but it's you know it's pretty w broadly defined now. So they, I think FSA, who runs Farm Service Agency, they run CRP. They're actively researching this stuff. Um, cool. And so we'll see what happens mm -hmm. with that. So I think that's it. And now we can do our takeaways. Um, uh, I don't know. Should I just leave it up here? Or should, I just, or should I talk about them? What do you think? We can leave them up there and have people read it because we are yeah. going to run out of time. Wow. <laughs> it was a very quick hour. Yeah. And I did, as, as people look at this, and, and we can leave this up for yeah. a, a bit, um, I did want to give, uh, well, let me do this. Let me ask both you and Claudia what you think the most important takeaway is from, from your recent study? Uh, from, our from the whole thing? Or yeah, just from the, the whole thing. What, what is okay. It? So okay. So we've, we've 
you've shown us the complexity. You've shown us how interesting it is. Um, but if, if, if somebody had to take one lesson away from this last hour and, and what was no doubt years of research on mm -hmm. your part, well, what would you yeah. have them take away from that? I guess I'll go first because it's easier. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, Good. so I think it's sure. that colony losses have increased quite dramatically over the past years, but we have stable colony numbers. So it's recognizing that mm -hmm. um, honeybees are managed, so there's multiple interventions, but um, like Dan mentioned before, you know, maybe are we nearing this point where management is no longer gonna gonna do it, and we actually need better forage out there. Are there limits to how much we can yeah. manage? Yeah, or we know there's nonlinear impacts for these s mm -hmm. black swan type events or something. Uh, so that's good, and I would add to that that uh, land use does seem to matter. We're not quite sure exactly how, but it does seem to matter, and there are likely to be real possible improvements to our pollinators crisis through careful, not even careful, through being smart about how we put up forage or put up plants that bees can pollinate on. So I stand on a potentially positive note. Yeah, I, I you know, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know good things can easy, be done and we, yeah, can, it's not we impossible. can improve them. Thank you both. Sure. This was incredibly informative. You conveyed, like I said, years, if not decades of research yeah. into, well, certainly decades, a uh, longitudinal study, mm -hmm. uh, into an hour. That's not easy to do. Uh, and you really um, definitely gave us a different perspective on uh, this ecological issue. So uh, much appreciated. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. And uh, maybe we can get you back out here in a, a couple of years no, as the study evolves, working, as yeah. the new models come about. That would be really I, fun. I would be happy to do that. Yeah. We'd love to do that. All right. So I will just end with that slide. Now, we're going to change the slide, and we're going to put on a link to our study when we finally get it through our editors. We would love <laughs> to do that. Good. And thank you all for tuning in.